social media to do the best of jobs in service of the people. It has to speak truth for power, but it has to power, but it has to do so as accurately and as truthfully as possible. Let me welcome everybody to our our monthly virtual group, um, which I'm so glad that I'm convening it. I mean, I'm moderating it from the north. It's a bit chilled where I am right now. And I'm so glad that at least we managed all of us to be here uh, to read our, our book for the month. My name is Doripula Hamtumwa, and I shall be your moderator. And I'm really glad that I, I, was, I had an opportunity to be away last month, but my abled colleague, patient Masue, honorable patient Masue, managed to step in for me and I was very, very happy to see that she managed to put it through. Uh, and the reading is really, as, as, as we've been alluding all the time, is that the book, the reading is convened by Desri Matias, uh, who is the advisor to the president of the Republic. And she is advisor on youth matters, enterprise development in the office of the president. And I would like to reiterate that the objective of the reading group is to promote the, the literature arts and continue to encourage or to calculate a culture where we expand our reading culture and as well as celebrating those that are writing uh, on the subject of, uh, of our history uh, as African and also more specifically literature that has advanced uh, the human existence. Um, I would like to inform you that today we will be reading, or Desiree will be reading uh, a, a very interesting book. I found it very interesting to read. And the title is uh, Comrade Editor on Life, Journalism, and the Birth of Namibia, a personal memoir by Gwen Lister, who is also on the platform today. Uh, and, uh, and Gwen, I'm so happy to see you. It has been a long time since we last saw each other. And uh, I'm so glad that you could join us this morning. So this session will be strictly uh, one hour. And I know that we might be discussing very interesting issues. And uh, I, will be, I will not be scared to rule if we, we are going to, to go above this one hour. And, uh, and I also just want to just highlight some few house rules. Uh, we are going to allow at, what, at, at the right point, Desri to review the book. And what we will also do is that we will also have an opportunity to, to give uh, Gwen an opportunity to provide some reaction, reflection, and also some, some, some response on Desiree's review. And uh, I will also allow uh, the participants to drop any questions in the chat room. Uh, and though some of those questions or reaction, I will post them to, to Desiree and, uh, and Gwen. Uh, and I'll also be creative enough to, to interrogate or to share or to stimulate further discussion on the on the on the book that I really Gwen, I really really enjoyed reading the book. I I was actually trying to look for your number so that I can really just call you and say, Gwen, what do you mean by this? Why did you say this, Gwen? When I was so glad to read your book. But having said that, without wasting time, let me invite um, Desiree Matthias to really give us a, her account, her review on the book. And, and maybe we can learn one or two from Desri. Desri, the opportunity is yours now, my sister, to, to review the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ndewilipula. And a very good morning to everybody who is joining us from near and far. It's really lovely to feel the sense of community that is growing. Um, I'm able to recognize some familiar faces in the names and also to welcome many newcomers to our group. You're all welcome to our July session. We meet every month uh, on the last Saturday of every month. And we do this because we want to promote the literary arts. We do this because we love reading. We want to learn as part of our commitment 
to continuous learning and growing. Over the past few months, our virtual reading meeting group has um, been exploring literature contexts, uh, modern literature contexts from across Africa. This year, we're focusing on African texts. We've read South African, Ghanaian, Nigerian, Zimbabwean. And today marks a really special homecoming because we're going to review and to engage our very first of many to follow Namibian authors. Um, in the person Ms. Gwen Lister. And we really have a full house. It's a, it's a good response. We're also streaming on live platforms so other audiences can follow the discussion. And just as a recap from last month, we engaged the, the themes of societal norms and culture. We looked at post-colonialism, at the drivers of gender-based violence and its effects. And in the final installment, we read Titi Ndarangeba's trilogy of this monable body from Zimbabwe. Today, we're joined by the veteran Namibian journalist, columnist, activist, Ms. Gwen Lister. And she'll be unpacking her autobiography, Comrade Editor, which is a memoir, an autobiography published this year in 2021. So it is that new, new. Um, and it's, it's a story that is told in her own words. We're going to recount Gwen's journey through life as an anti-apartheid, as a press freedom activist. Gwen, I can only say thank you very much for being here with us to tell the story yourself, but also inspiring us to be able to tell our own stories. A little about the author. Our guest author today was born in 1953 in East London in South Africa. And that is where she obtained her junior secondary education. She attended a convent as did I. And then she also went on to the University of Cape Town where she obtained her Bachelor of Arts in Ethics, Political Philosophy and History. But she has adopted Namibia as her home, and she's been living here way before um, some of us were born. Uh, she, she is the recipient of a number of International Courage Awards in journalism and was named the World Press Freedom Hero by the International Press Institute in the year 2000. Gwen is a voracious writer. She is a reader. She's a mother, a mother of two, and currently the chairperson of the Namibia Media Trust, among many other responsibilities that she sees too. And always, before we dive into the book, we always provide a little context of where we are on the continent in the country at this moment in time. Um, and as part of that context, I can go back to indicate that Namibia social Malu was defined by very harsh realities where the indigenous Black majority could be seen but not heard and they had no democratic rights uh, whatsoever pre-independence. Our history is one that is characterized by colonial repression, dispossession, exploitation by men onto fellow men. And it is unfortunately one of racial segregation where the white race was perceived to be superior and where the African was um, reduced to being inhumane and dehumanized. Fortunately, our forebearers did not sit idle and they did not wallow. Our leaders rose to the challenges and they fought heroic battles. They faced um, fierce resistance to those who illegally occupied our country. They were united by a common cause and this motivated them on a very clear mission. That was the total liberation of Namibia from foreign domination and also to liberate all her inhabitants from oppression at all cost. Our country and nation has grown and we have evolved through the stages of development at infancy with the dawn of independence and sovereignty in 1990. But also through the stages, I would like to use the analogy of a growing child. We went through the childlike euphoria in the early years of our self-determination and reconciliation, and also into the stages of adolescence where we started to do self-discovery, went through youthful jubilation, and really went into a consolidation as well of our identity and of the, fu the fundamentals that uphold our nationhood. Today, 31 years later, I, I believe we're chewing bones now. We are, we are grown, we are maturing. The country has matured in her political, in her social, in her economic and her constitutional life. And we have a culture of free and fair elections, respect for fundamental human rights, um, good or effective governance and political tolerance. That is the culture that has taken root in Namibia today. So coming from a history that is as complex as ours and with the multi multiplicity of ethnic groups and the psychological segregation that we've been through, I can say that we've achieved a great deal 
um, through our freedoms, through our peace, through our stability, our social cohesion, and greater prosperity. But uh, we continue to safeguard all of those. We have to safeguard them to avoid reversals on our democratic gains. And we can only do so by refining and strengthening our democratic institutions, the processes and the, and the, and the systems that govern. So our social political landscape has evolved significantly over the three decades and, or you could say four decades pre-independence. And I believe that today we find ourselves at a juncture where we've got a, we're at a very pivotal straight stage in our country's trajectory. To frame this intersection of politics, governance, the role of the media and nation building, will conduct the review of Gwen's memoir and Gwen will provide a response. And then we're going to engage in a, in a conversation on some of the key themes that, I, that we found to be emanating from, from the text. So as I jump into the review, view, please follow me. And this is going to be a sprint because Gwen, you've really done a significant job with this book. It's um, a substantive text. Um, and I, I have the tough job of doing a review in 10 to 15 minutes. The story is told in her own words, and Gwen is the eldest daughter of John and Joan Lister, a bank clerk and a stay-at-home mother, and sister to John and to Gillian. The family had moved often in her formative years, and this limited her ability to forge lasting relationships at, at the childhood stage, but she was raised in a middle-income in, middle class family, Raised by an English speaking family of British descent, she enjoyed a special bond with um, particularly her paternal grandparents and her grandmother um, more especially. And this love and this sense of acceptance and belonging is what I believe assured Gwen of her confidence and her self identity in the years that were to come. Gwen experienced the political awakening in her early teens that which was stirred a lot by the American civil rights movement by prominent um, resistance activists. The stark contrast that she started to see of the racial inequality in her home country became more and more pronounced as she became more aware of the world around her. She consumed a lot of media at a young age intentionally to expose herself as a young girl to current affairs and to world to global affairs. Her sense of conviction grew to oppose the racialized society that she found herself living in. Um, she was confronted by internal conflicts and contradictions um, because Gwen was not only reconciling the separation of black people from white people under the policy of apartheid, she was also, I'm interpreting from her text, she was also processing the deeply rooted cultural disparities that existed between her community of the more liberal English speakers of British descent and the more conservative Afrikaners native to South Africa. Notably, both groups discriminated against Black people and both groups bought into the apartheid regime because it benefited both the groups, but it benefited them in different ways. Um, I think she increasingly became aware of her privilege, a privilege that she was born into that she didn't ask for, but her privilege made her more and more uncomfortable um, and more curious. Um, she questioned a lot about the world that she lived in. She questioned her parents' stance on the prejudicial society and the behavior of you know, the society around her, which she felt was contradictory to what she was taught at home about civility and decency. And that is what her parents preached and practiced. Over time and through her years at university, her anti-Africana, if I may, Gwen, and anti-apartheid sentiment, sentiments began, began to intensify. And uh, she became really fully manifest as a young adult professional who had turned into an advocate, into an activist against the repressive apartheid regime. And the proverbial pen, pen, the proverbial pen was her choice weapon of war, akin to Chinua Achebe, who said that literature is my weapon. There was a destiny altering encounter, um, which Gwen describes to be her Rosa Parks moment or her aha moment, a defining moment. And it took place at the tender age of 13 years old when Gwen was on a bus where she was innocently, um, she stood up to yield her seat to an elderly black woman who struggled to mount the bus and to enter the bus. 
But this she did in contravention with the petty apartheid laws that were in place. So both she and the woman who she tried to assist were verbally assaulted by a very offended white occupants. Um, and this encounter triggered within her an ideological turning point. I believe this was Gwen's Rubicon. This was the point of no return where she made a lifelong commitment to confront white supremacy and to fight for justice, to fight for equality and to fight for dignity. In 1976, after completing her, her degree, she relocated to then Southwest Africa, now Namibia, where Hannah Smith, known as Smitty, who was the editor at the time of the Windhoek Advertiser, became her very first employer, and later her professional tutor, mentor, and a longtime, I could say, friend and business partner. It was under Smitty that Gwen spread her wings and cut her journalistic teeth, um, and she carved out a niche for herself in political reporting. At the time, the Turnhalle Conference was on, it had started in 1975, and there was a lot of subsequent political developments in the country at the time. So Gwen was at the right place at the right time, and she really started to, um, to document the dark moments that ensued in our country's political history pre-independence and post the Turnhalle Conference, um, which, um, you know, had included the formation of the DTA, the Democratic Turnhalle Alliance, and also the intervention by the United Nations to sanction the Western Group of Five. Um, these were all recorded and headlined under her hand and signature, but also under the watchful eye of Smitty. Gwen increasingly became labeled as a terrorist sympathizer, um, and this stigma would cost her. It left her more and more politically isolated or exposed um, to being mocked and to being watched. Um, and also the advertiser that she worked for as well as her family, her immediate family, to such an extent that it ended up costing her father his job at, um, at the bank where he, he was in senior management because of the stigma associated with the activism of, of, of the daughter. He eventually left the country and, and, and went back and, and started his own um, small transport company. Together with Smitty, Gwen resigned from the advertiser and they started coinc coinciding with the Kasinga massacre on the 4th of May in 1978. They opened the Windhoek Observer, a paper that we still have in independent Namibia today, perhaps under different management. The newspaper was described to be one that outraged some and delighted others by defying the moral and political structures observed by most. I think we'll begin to appreciate the character of Gwen as we continue and understand why this was the description given to her baby. In the startup phase of the venture, Gwen shared perspectives on the demands on, on startups, on the demands that require a multidisciplinary leadership approach to somebody that is starting a new venture, the flexibility that was required in her work. Um, she demonstrated a lot of um, latitude. She was a freelance co correspondent at the time as well for the Africa service of the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC. She was also freelancing for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation at the same time that they had taken over the the, or started the Windhoek Observer. And it also, as I read between you know, the text and the encounters that she has, it's also narrated during this time, the kinds of sexual harassment, the kinds of advances that a woman had to put up with, a woman who was operating in a man's world. But she was undeterred and in fact, she continued to work stronger. By 1985, Gwen started the Namibian newspaper, where she worked closely with um, a colleague, Raja Munamava. The independent paper went on to expose the ongoing atrocities in the country, the human rights violations by the South African Defense Forces, and eventually, you know, chronicled the dawn of a new era as the country transitioned into sovereignty and nationhood. Gwen continued to grow in rapport during that time of activism with the rank and file of the Swapo party, chronicling encounters with um, stalwarts such as the founding father in Paris and the incumbent president, President Hage Ganko, in an encounter in Helsinki in 1980, where she drew an, he drew an unforgettable parallel um, as an analogy explaining why 
Swapo had decided to seek help from communists um, because he was dismissing the accusation by the South African government that uh, the Swapo party was indeed branded a communist organization. And he said, when you are in water and you are drowning, do you refuse a helping hand that comes to assist you in, in terms saying that we took the help that was available and so suit the Western powers that had ignored our calls for assistance and did not come to our aid. Notably, Gwen declined Swapo membership um, twice, a belief that she holds on until today, that um, journalists should operate in a space of political neutrality, regardless of your personal sympathy to, to a political party. And that is something that she holds to this day. She narrates vividly what it was like to be there for monumental occasions in our country's history, such as the release of late Antimba Toivoya Toivo from Robben Island um, and the Swapo Party's recognition by the United Nations as the sole and authentic representative of the Namibian people. And during this time, um, the intensification of preparations towards the country's first UN supervised elections that were due in 1989. The arrival of Marti Atisari marked um, the formal intervention of the United Nations um, into the Namibian transition territory. Marti Atisari was the United Nations special representative who was sent to head the United Nations Transition Assistance Group, what we know as UNTAG growing up, and um, essentially to supervise that the elections would be free and fair. The book captures the period of political turmoil in the country that is leading up to independence. There was a lot of tension um, and a lot of distrust, um, and it was a very um, charged atmosphere, um, which led to the resignation of P.W. Bota, the, in, the former Minister of Defense of the South African administration, with very little impact on the settlement plan that they were negotiating. Gwen also narrates unfortunate um, political associations such as that of the human rights activist Anton Laboski in 1989, and the return of the founding father Sam Nyoma to the country in September of that year. On the 13th of November 89 was when, after a very well executed um, campaign strategy that was uh, under the directorship of the incumbent president, President Hage Ganko, that was when Marti Atisari announced an almost 100% poll and declared the elections free and fair. And pursuant to that, the unceremonious departure of long convoys of military trucks. It had signaled the birth of a new nation and the dawn of a new era. And it must have felt surreal at the time. I was only three or four years old. However, um, through similar accounts that have been recorded and through the books, you know, the pages on this book, I was able to live that moment vicariously and take, be transported back into time to be able to experience what it was like to be there. The book continues to observe the establishment of the new Namibian government, which leadership had shifted gear drastically now. They came in as revolutionaries who were overthrowing an oppressive colonial regime. But in the process, they had to ensure that there was peace. They had to embrace reconciliation. They had to embrace amnesty and integration of the, of this, of the public service. And by so doing, they became transactional leaders. The Constituent Assembly was chaired by the incumbent president, President Hage Genkop. And you know, what was supposed to be a very difficult exercise that people thought would take two years, took the Constituent Assembly three months to draft the, the lauded, internationally lauded Namibian constitution. In post-independence Namibia, we are really dealing with a uh, post-conflict society. We are looking at um, the administration of the government by the ruling elite. We are looking at the intersection of the role of the media with um, governance institutions and in the process of, of, of nation building. This is a journey that Gwen has had to really make personal sacrifices. There have been attempts on her life um, in her capacity as um, the editor of the Namibian. And what we see in your life, Gwen, and I think also in the life of Smitty, is the power and the importance of a childhood dream. And also visible in the life of the countless stalwarts, the different characters and leadership profiles that you, you know, had in the book who had leadership thrust upon them. But because you are the protagonist, I'm focusing on you 
the belief in the power to change the world. Um, and that is the currency. It took me to a quotation by the poet Mary Oliver, who asked, tell me what it is that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Uh, reading this story provided a very vivid, a very reflective, insightful, and beautifully honest account. Um, it's rich in historical facts, and it was generous in humor. I found the book easy to read. Um, it was a quick, relatively quick read, but it was a very long read. It was a very um, historically rich account. But I also found the book to be a relatable human story. And I say this because when I've heard you in your TED talk saying that you are intentionally emotionally distant and you tend to depersonalize yourself to a large extent because of the, the high risk and the work that you do. But in this book, you are vulnerable. You related a lot through the central themes, through the personal trials and tribulations that you shared and also the conflicts that you had to endure. And as a young woman that is motivated by a vision to do good for my country, it resonated strongly with me, your values of compassion, honesty, commitment, and also your character that is nonconformist, that is defiant, um, that takes an uncompromising stance on matters of principle. You confront injustice, you're willing to put, you, you know, to will yourself forward, which demonstrates a lot of courage, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of dedication. There was a pain requirement. And even your nocturnal habits and highly motivated work ethic, there was a lot of that resonated with me. Um, so the central, the central character, the protagonist, the autobiographer, in this case, you, Gwen, did not only tell the single story of one single woman, I believe that central character is a multi-dimensional woman who is a very resilient woman, one who is standing in her truth, who's pioneering, who's leading, who is serving, and who's fighting for a cause in Namibia today. So it's very much a woman that all of us could relate to. There was a very sentimental tribute, I think a worthy tribute to your longtime colleague, to your longtime business partner, your longtime mentor, Hannes uh, Smitty, may he rest in peace. And I was also inspired by your optimistic and forward looking outlook for the country, that was that was more futuristic and looking beyond um, the post-conflict society. It's easier to recall the events of yesterday than it is to reimagine what tomorrow could look like. As I draw to a close of my analysis, there were a few themes that were cutting across the text. The first theme was that of post-colonialism, decoloniality, and rebuilding a post-conflict society. The other was about the fourth estate, the role of the media, and also the ability of the media to polarize. It brought into the view of rights, the media freedoms, but also accountability and undertones of information and dis disinformation. There was a big theme, I believe, on privilege and equity. There was a strong theme on the convergence of human rights in our modern day contemporary society, you fought so hard for human rights to defend, to restore, to uphold. But I think the, the post-independence Namibia is dealing with a different type of, of human rights frontier that equally needs to be upheld and defended and restored. And that is in the area of digital rights. Um, you also touched on the themes of gender biases, of feminism, chauvinism, misogyny and violence, even sexual harassment, um, which leads me to the themes of women's agency, uh, the voice of women, the representation of women, even in corporate, in, in different sectors and business of, um, sectors of leadership, and generally as a principle, the voice of women in thought leadership in the country. Um, finally, it was the theme of leadership. Um, leadership in the previous dispensation, but more, I think, towards the end of your conclusion, you took a forward-looking approach to leading in the 21st century. Um, the transition between the transactional to a transformational leader and how they relate to each other, but also been, uh, Gwen, a very strong focus on the ethics and the morality of leadership. 
and what ethical leadership should look like in Namibia going forward. So I would like to end with two quotations, one that is retrospective, that talks to the media, the contribution, the intersection of, um, of the window to the country, to the Namibian house that allowed the world to look in and to see the plight of the Namibians, but also a forward-looking quotation, both of them by His Excellency the President, that talks to the generational mandate of the born free generation, the new Namibian uh, young people who must take the baton and move the country forward. The first quote reads, quote unquote, that our press were the holes that allowed the outside world to peek inside the walls of the apartheid regime prison. They allowed the outside world to see the reality of life within these prison walls. They, thereby garnering the support that ultimately led to the destruction of that prison and the liberation of its captives. That was an extract from his World Press Freedom Day statement of 2017. And the next is an extract from his 2021 State of the Nation address delivered in April, and it reads, quote, unquote, ours is the generation that must embody the aspirations of economic independence and prosperity. Under the weight of difficulty, we must remain unbroken, resilient, and rise to build a more united and a stronger Namibia. And I believe these two quotes juxtapose really speak to where we're coming from, but also the generational mandate of uh, where we need to go to. And this is the end of my review. I yield the floor back to the moderator to receive your response, Gwen. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Desiree, for that uh, insightful review. I, I can only just agree with you. I, I, was just, I was just going through my notes. Uh, I religiously had a, a, a pen and I was going through all the lines of the text and really just uh, appreciating that historical account by Gwen. But without wasting time, uh, this remains, allow me to invite Gwen to make any reflection or dispute what you just reflected now. Gwen, please, the floor is yours now, Gwen. Thank you, Deji, for a very thorough analysis of the book. I don't know if it leaves me with terribly much to say, um, but I'll try and fill in some of the, the sort of uh, background, if you like, uh, to the writing of this memoir. And thank you both again, and all of you, who participate in this forum. I think it's a wonderful idea. And uh, I'm first and foremost a great fan of anybody setting up something which will encourage a reading culture in Namibia. And also, you know, the kind of forum to really unpack things uh, that we're dealing with as a nation and that our writers are bringing to the fore. So thanks for that. Um, I thought, um, Deidre, I might start with, because it's a, a question that a lot of people do ask me, uh, why did I write this book? Uh, so I thought I'd sort of run through a couple of the reasons. And I think initially I was quite reluctant. Um, many people know that it's always difficult for a journalist who does a certain type of news writing to suddenly sit down and write a book. So it's not the easiest thing for a journalist to do. Um, and I was also reluctant because I felt that, you know, both in the African context and internationally, there, there's so many other journalists with stories so much bigger than mine. Um, but then I was finally encouraged to do it because I thought if nothing else, it would, in, or hopefully it could inspire the youth is in particular to pursue their dreams and to do something good in the process. And if that was the outcome of this book, then it was worth doing that. Um, there is, as you, you mentioned in your review, also a quote that I used in the front of the book, uh, which means a lot to me and which speaks to a lot of what I think I did in my life. And that is a quote by Margaret Mead, where she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I was really moved by that sort of um, issue. And I was hoping also that, that this would inspire others to really try their best to make a difference. 
Secondly, I think that, you know, I believe that just about everybody on this platform and further afield have a book within us, a book of some kind or another. It might not be a memoir, it might be a novel, it might be poetry, or it might be an historic uh, um, uh, work. Um, and I think that leads me to say that obviously another reason that encouraged me to do the book is we all feel that a lot more Namibians need to be telling their stories, you know, to enrich our history and our literary life, and also to encourage this culture of reading and writing um, and, and, and keep also local languages alive, depending on the language you choose to write in. And I think it's fundamentally important that we encourage this. And I think it's a big absence in our national life today, a lack of reading culture. And I think if Namibians read more, uh, we would achieve more. I think there's very little doubt about that. Then as to the actual writing of the book, because again, I think you asked me, Desri, um, did you just write it in one sitting or how did this happen? Um, and actually it's been written over a number of years, decades in fact, where every now and then I've kind of committed to pen to paper to write about a chapter um, that really I felt at the time I needed to, to, to really put to paper. Um, my kind of lifestyle in media, 24 seven work and a very ballistic lifestyle made it diff very difficult for me to kind of take a sabbatical and go off for six months and, and write this book. Um, and then another thing that has to be kept in mind so much of our history um, going back to the 70s and the 80s is not kind of online. Um, so much of the putting together of this book came from memory, um, came from bits and pieces of records and papers, uh, came from newspapers. Um, you'll note in the book, <coughs> excuse me, that one point I had burned all my diaries because every time I was arrested, the security forces would confiscate the diaries and obviously get information from that source, excuse me. So it, it, it really um, was cobbled together from memory and newspaper cuttings that su survived the decades. <coughs> Sorry. And also I think it's, it's very important to note that memory is very selective. Um, and I'm most aware of that and was aware of that while writing uh, this memoir, uh, that sometimes we remember events in perhaps not the same way as many of other, other friends and colleagues, even enemies, may have uh, remembered those issues. <clears throat> and there's a quote that I think I found somewhere, and I'm not sure who I can attribute it to, but it says this, what sticks to memory often are those odd little fragments that have no beginning and no end. And uh, I think that speaks to me uh, in the writing of this book. I think in particular of the uh, death of Emmanuel Shafidi. Emmanuel was a former Robben Island prisoner who was released. He was one of the great friends of the newspaper. And, you know, when I think of the day that he was killed, and I think we all, you know, I think it's something we all need to think about, even those of us on this discussion today will all take away something different. None of our memories of this will be probably wrong, but they'll be different. And, and even the day that, that Emmanuel Shafidi was killed, I was driving to Katatura when I heard there was, there was trouble at a Swapo rally. And uh, just as I arrived there, Emmanuel had just been killed. He was still lying on the ground. And I just remember the sight of this wonderful man who used to always visit our offices with a copy of the Namibian tucked under his arm, lying there on a dusty Katatura sports field um, with blood on his Namibian t-shirt, which he was wearing at the time. And shortly after that, just remembering the Caspers, which were on the scene at the time and the firing of rubber bullets. And I remember being pinned up against a fence in Katatura and getting a rubber bullet hit against the back of my leg which of course left a big purple mark for a long time after that. And I remember Bob Fazira Kandetu laughing later in the day when we kind of 
looked at what had happened that afternoon. It wasn't a, a, a funny event, but he just remembered as I rushed to Katatura to get to this event that he heard the security forces from the top of the Cas Caspers yelling, here come Lister, here comes Lister. So, you know, it, it, it's strange how when you putting together a book, um, and this is why I think it must be said, I, this is not a history book and I am not an academic very clearly. Um, so I opted for a memoir really to personalize the story because there are various strands in this book. And I think Daisri, you've mentioned what those are already. It's the story of a very idealistic young woman wanting to make a difference in the world and seeing journalism as, as the way to try and do that. Um, you will also note in the book that at one point I did mull joining the armed struggle and realized that wasn't for me um, and that I would prefer to try and, and write and make a difference in that way. So it's the story of that young girl who really felt she could make a difference and make a change. Also as a young white girl who wanted to show the world that not everybody agreed with what was happening under apartheid and that people needed to stand up and be counted in this process of fighting this dreadful scourge. Secondly, of course, it's the story of a life in journalism. It's the story of starting various newspapers, of forging a life in what was then a very dominant man's world. Um, you'll also recall from the reading of the book that um, when I applied for the job on the Vintook Advertiser in 1976, one of the first things Smitty told me was that women belong in the bedroom and in the kitchen, but they certainly don't belong in the newsroom and certainly not doing political reporting. And so I think that kind of led me, although that wasn't my intent at the time, but the fact that I really was so convinced about what I was doing and that it was right, that it led me, I think, to become the first newspaper editor, woman newspaper editor in Southern Africa, which, if you told me that at the time, I probably would have said would not have been possible. So yes, those are just some of the, 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 the streams of the book. And the third, of course, and, and very important one is that it talks about the birth of a nation and the birth of a country. So those three strands were very difficult to, to integrate, if you like, in the book. Um, as a person who had always very closely guarded her privacy, because of the way the security forces always intruded on our lives and wanted to use anything they could against us. Um, that was probably the most difficult part of all in writing this book, was to really dig deep within myself and in my private and personal persona. Um, and especially during those times under, under apartheid and now I have to reveal myself. And I think that was, uh, that was difficult to do, although I'm glad that I did do it um, because it, it, it sort of also forced me to, to look at my own self, something I hadn't done over the years. I'd been so impelled, if you like, by the struggle and what was happening in this country that I never really took time to take stock and look at why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and so this provided me with, with that opportunity and it kind of at the end of it, um, and when the book was published, quite honestly, um, and I'm, I'm a fairly contained person. If I'm emotional, I'm normally emotional by myself and alone. And I had a bit of a meltdown and I thought really it was a kind of post-traumatic stress syndrome really kicking in after all these decades, crazy though it is because you keep this illusion and this um, to, to the world outside that you're strong and you can deal with everything and you put a brave face to the world. But behind that often is that still insecure uh, young girl who used to bite her nails to the quick and wondering if she was doing the right thing. So I've mentioned briefly those, those strands. And of course, um, I think I, I can say that last year, really, I finished doing the majority of the manuscript and when I did so, it was a huge uh, manuscript of nearly 300,000 words. And so I kind of contacted publishers all over the show and they all basically screamed and ran in the other direction and said, no, it's not possible to publish a book of that length. 
So if finally I settled upon the South African publisher Tafelberg, but they also wanted it edited down by more than half. So I think that the editing was probably even more difficult than the actual writing. Uh, I think the writing was probably pretty easy in comparison. And each time I had to delete whole sections, even chapters, I can honestly say I felt that I was bleeding at every turn. I was also reminded of a quote by Stephen King, who puts it really well. It's fairly brutal, but he puts it like this. And I think many aspiring writers will have to deal with this very issue um, of editing. And Stephen King said the following, when your story is ready for rewrite, cut it to the bone, get rid of every ounce of fat, this is going to hurt. Revising a story down to the bare essentials is always a little like murdering children, but it must be done. Um, and, and really, that's the way I felt. I, I absolutely hated it. I looked at this book when it came out, and I thought it should be double this length. There's far more that is not in it than is in it. But what is in there, I think it has to be said, Daisy, is as honest and as truthful as I could possibly be. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy, happy with that. And I, I'm glad actually that Comrade Editor finally uh, saw the light of day, even though I complained all the way to edit it down to what it is now. So Desiree, I don't know. I think your summary was very good. I've said these few words. Um, maybe let's see what people are interested in and the kind of questions they ask so that I don't spend all the time uh, dominating this discussion. Thank you. Thanks for that response, Gwen. While the people are coming onto the floor through the moderator, I think I just wanted to emphasize uh, what a significant contribution it is to our country's um, body literature. Because like you rightly say, there are so many experiences of one single event and the different perspectives um, I'm fortunate to have heard a lot of these stories because of my family background, also coming from political activists, um, because of my work in politics and serving the leader of the party at the time. But listening it from you was a different nuance, a different perspective. Um, I was so tremendously impressed by your vivid recollection. And I understand now it's because you did it in phases and you're very meticulous uh, in, 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 in documenting that, that information. But um, you've added um, a third dimension to stories that we thought we had heard a hundred times. And that's why I can say, I thought I knew, but I really had no idea. Deulipula. Gwen, thank you very much for those reaction. When I, I think if you, if, if you may allow, when I, I recall uh, when I was writing the book, we we're trying to trace you to try and find where you are so that you can help edit my, my book. And now I understand that you had to cut 50% of the content that you have already written to, to bring out Comrade Editor. But I, 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 I thought maybe I should share just this way, if you allow, my experience. And, uh, you know, if somebody, a child that was raised in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in exile and lived in the former East Germany, coming back to Namibia, there was always a gap in the literature. There has always been a gap in our understanding because most of the th information that we had was just really the history about uh, the leadership of the country, because that's where we were surrounded, we were surrounded by them. But there was always a, a missing link in terms of uh, the internal dynamics. And there's always been a gap and a, and a deep void uh, of contrast really to understand, uh, or maybe better to understand this dichotomy of this comparison who made the greatest contribution to the liberation struggle? And I think that unanswered question has always created conflict in our deliberation. And I, and I thought you have brought a greater perspective to that question. And I must uh, 
thank you, Gwen, that I think you have just uh, filled a deeper, deeper void that I personally, and I'm sure many that were born or raised in exile, uh, did not have. And, and I think your work has just contributed to, to adding to the body of work, to the body of knowledge. And I was even thinking that maybe I should have waited for Gwen to release her book so that I have a, a better perspective to write my book. But I think now the next volume will be different. It will definitely be different. And I just wanted also to add to what Desiree was saying. Desiree, if you may, may allow, is, uh, is Gwen's, Gwen's ability to, 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 to having a, 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 a inborn, a, a inborn um, I don't know if it's an appeal or a drive to get uh, buy-in from those that even did not necessarily agree uh, with her in the in the initial stage. I just recall the in the story when Gwen had to to receive information from uh, Fanuel Kazongwizi that deemed to be very very confid confidential at that time. But uh, there was, you know, that sense of, of providing information to Gwen, because even those that initially did not agree with her felt that what she was doing was very important for the, for the struggle at that time. And I think Gwen, those are some of the things that, that I, could, I could pick up. At least now I understand your son, who I had an opportunity to play football with at school. His his standing, his view, and uh, and and I think that is really a bit of uh, some reaction. But I I don't want to take up time. Mine was just to moderate. But I I felt that in uh, you gave me a medicine to understand uh, something that has always been a gap in my life. Having said that, Gwen, while people are probably going to put in their comment, I just thought maybe it's important that we. We, we reflect on few things and mo mostly maybe just build on what Destry was reflecting on some of the key themes that I personally agree with her. And maybe if we can maybe just dive into some of those things just to, to broaden the, the discussion. And I think I wanted us to really reflect on the, 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 the fourth estate and, re and the uh, pluralization of the media, uh, a better understanding the rights and the freedom of accountability, the whole concept of this, this and, in, and misinformation. And maybe just starting with you, Gwen, I, I wanted to really understand uh, from your view and knowing that you have played an active role in establishing and now uh, having retired on a, on a number of the media platform uh, and now being an observer, what are your thoughts on the Namibian media landscape today? And more, spe on me, on more spe specifically, uh, focusing on issues around quality, standard, and accountability. What is really your view on those, on those issues, on quality, standard, and accountability in the mainstream media? Um, obviously, yeah, as you've mentioned, a lot of the book deals with media. And um, it also deals with the fact that, that my life has been one involved in media because I do believe in the power of the press. Um, I do believe that media or independent media in particular is indispensable to democracy. And usually where that thrives, the democracy is thriving. So that having been said, I obviously believe in the power of, and I add this adjective, good journalism. Um, it's a very complicated world out there now, much more complicated than it was when I started out back in the 70s. Um, and there was simply print and there was some radio and that was it. There was nothing else. There was no internet. And I think this is what a lot of the youth don't realize today. Even as a young journalist then, you had to foot slog it to wherever you wanted to go. You had to get to the library to do your research because there was no touch screen to, to Google things, um, cell phones to pick up and call people. So definitely journalism has obviously changed considerably over the years since I started out. But in turn, obviously there are now 
big issues, not only about its sustainability, because journalism is in danger, good journalism. And it's always been my concern that the public don't care enough uh, really to, to keep it strong. It's a strange thing because if I think back to the days when we started the Namibian in 1985, I mean, there would not be a single newspaper left. People would eat up that newspaper literally, uh, would crowd the cooker shops, would come to our offices, uh, would demand copies of the paper um, because it was their daily history book. It was telling them what was happening in their country. And obviously since independence, maybe, you know, to a certain extent, we became free. People get complacent. Uh, the media suddenly didn't have the same kind of role uh, that it had back in the struggle years where it was trying to uh, show what was happening in terms of the and un what under the jackboot of apartheid to Namibians. Um, and after independence, everybody's kind of rested on their laurels a little bit, I think, not realizing that we won many battles with the attainment of independence, but there were many still more to be fought, maybe even more important battles, such as the economic and social battle for the social justice for our people and equality and all those things. Um, but somehow along with that and with the onset of the uh, uh, digital uh, era, uh, people obviously fled to social media, to Facebook, to Twitter, to WhatsApp. And a lot of people seem to get their news and information from there rather than the media. So I think one of the risks is that as media or traditional media battles for survival in this new world, that there's a tendency to resort to the clickbait that um, and disinformation even and yellow journalism that is found online um, in order to compete. And that's a very unfortunate thing. So I, um, by the way, not retired yet, still not, still very active. And one of the things I try to do is, is work with young people. Um, I also do a lot of podcasts around all things media to hold high the banner of professionalism in media um, because for media to do the best of jobs in service of the people it has to speak truth for power but it has to power but it has to do so as accurately and as truthfully as possible so yes there are huge challenges right now for the media not only in our country but further afield but at the end of the day at least that voice is still being heard um, and I just wish that with more support from people out there, good journalism will rise to the top and will, and again, people need to be selective in the kind of information they read because there's also a lot of bad journalism out there. So choose the best, um, whether you are reading a newspaper, whether you are following a certain account on Twitter or on Facebook, um, try and be discerning as Namibian citizens. Um, often those citizens standing in judgment of the traditional media and a newspaper headline or a photograph used wrongly are the very ones sharing the disinformation in their WhatsApp groups and on Facebook. So as I say, lessons for us all, but a free press is absolutely indispensable. It always was. We fought for that free press that we enjoy today so that we number one in Africa and hopefully we hold on to that because Again, I always say it's not, it's, it's, it's a struggle that's never fully won. It always has to be fought for because governments change, people change, and the press will always be in danger, fortunately today, in a better position here than in many countries. But again, we have to guard that uh, press freedom and that free speech and that free expression uh, very religiously to ensure that it's here for generations to come. Thanks for that, Gwen. I want to come in um, just kind of in follow up of, of those reactions. And I want to take you into two directions. One is looking at, um, at still the role of the media and how powerful the media is. Um, at the time when you were using the media as a tool, you were using it um, to, to 
undo the injustices because injustice has its roots in the dehumanization of different groups of people, whether it was through slavery, colonialism, the Holocaust, uh, gender-based violence, it's dehumanizing. Um, and it's influenced a lot by how we relate with people who are different from us. Um, racism and prejudice is, is, is engineered in that space. So growing up, you witnessed a lot of propaganda. In the book, you talked about how the National Party used their propaganda machinery to, you know, repress other political parties and to fuel bigotry, to fuel biases, um, mostly towards Black people at the time. How we relate to people may never, that we haven't met, is increasing in this world that is so integrated, is shaped a lot by the media, the images that we are seeing and what we are consuming. So I wanted to hear from you um, a, a personal reflection, Gwen. What made you see humans to see something different where the world was teaching you how to think and training you giving you a, a filter of what to see and what to think um, and in obviously in the context that we're in now the media continues to have a filter and to train the eye what to see and how to, what to perceive and how are we using the media effectively in shaping um, the nuances that we need in post-independence Namibia. The second one, also because of, of the dimension of media that you're in, in the contemporary age, we've moved into the digital space and you've touched on it. Within the digital space, there's still, I believe, a human rights issue that we need to work on within the digital rights, um, protecting women, protecting children on the internet from violence, from abuse, uh, from um, a lot of what we see, casual disrespect. Because the truth is that it's digitally enab enabled violence but it has real consequences in real life. And it seems that independent countries that fought so hard for the protection of human rights and the safeguarding of human rights are not able to guarantee these rights online on the internet. Um, I, I want to hear your reflections on, on some of the, the reforms and you know, considerations that a country like Namibia needs to take in order for us to be the banner of human rights and to uphold them um, even on the internet. Thank you for that, Deji. Also from the observation that we, uh, you know, back in the day of the 70s um, and the 80s, our big enemy was fighting propaganda, um, you know, and, and that's kind of shifted today, it's disinformation. But then it was propaganda, but it's all lies. So it, it's one and the same thing. It's just that the one has a more official form and the other is by agents in this digital space who are trying to cause mayhem for what, whatever reason. So I think that's very important. We always did fight against that. And I think one of the important roles of the media um, going forward in this new digital age, if they're doing their jobs properly, and that's unfortunate because it kind of takes them away from sometimes the core function of informing the people, but that is also to, to kind of be check, or maintain checks and balances against the disinformation that is happening online. Um, and you will know, and I heard recently uh, that uh, I think it applies to Namibia as well, that most people in Namibia, that in Africa in general, but I think in Namibia too, source their, the main source of their news and information is WhatsApp. So I think if that is true, um, we already see the danger lights flickering because all of you know who on this group that WhatsApp is a very useful thing to communicate with your friends and so on, but it is also a place where disinformation spreads and it's, it's a closed space. You can't see WhatsApp you, you, in the sense that I'm not on your family's WhatsApp group to see, for example, how your mother may be asking you to get her some ivermectin because she's heard that that is the cure uh, for COVID and so on, and how you are going to compete or to, to combat the disinformation in those spaces is probably not up to the media, but as much as it can um, disabuse people of a lot of the falsehoods that are being spread on social media platforms that are more open, I think they should certainly be doing that. So I think that is a very important role uh, for the media going uh, forward. Um, as to what we can do about it, Desri, again, you know, there's no silver bullet. 
for how to regulate, if that's the right word, um, the uh, digital world, social media. My sort of long and short opinion is really that you probably won't be able to do it effectively at all. Um, because the only way it seems to me that there is kind of any regulation happening is when you hear of countries simply switching off uh, social media, depending on the circumstances in those countries at the time. And especially if the voice of the people gets too loud, um, they tend to do that. Uh, and that's obviously a, a really bad sign of what is happening, because you can't give people freedom of expression with one hand and take it away with another. So I think that is uh, something we need to look at going forward, whether media literacy can, can help. Um, I think there are renewed efforts nowadays to focus on media literacy, to emphasize that individuals online must kind of be circumspect about what they do and where they go, that harassment and misogyny and cyberbullying have become par for the course. So it takes a thick skin actually to be an opinionated person and go out there on social media and have to deal with some of the abuse that will inevitably happen. Obviously a lot of focus also on big tech themselves as to what they can do to make uh, social media in particular safer spaces for people to be. Um, but as to any efforts to regulate social media by politicians, um, I think that's not going to work. At the end of the day, I think people do have access um, to the law um, when things happen. And we've had a few examples here of, in Namibia of people going to court for defamation online and so on, that we, we need to still continue to use those tools. But I don't think we will find a way to effectively regulate media. I think that's up or social media. I think that's largely up to people themselves. And maybe as we become more sophisticated online, people will turn their backs on disinformation um, and lies and propaganda and, and hate speech and, and move into a more democratic space, space which is all, all we wished for uh, for digital media when it started out in the early 90s. I'm going to start moving to a close um, in the interest of time, but it, it is my view that um, if we don't create safe spaces online, it could be in lieu of thought leadership, where we have very important voices that need to be part of the conversation, that need to drive the social discourse, and because they withdraw, it can actually create a vacuum that affects the quality of our democracy. It creates room for populism, for fascism, and just for all around opportunists to, to fill that space. I, um, I think it's, um, it's really a, um, a weakness that needs to be addressed so that we can get the best out of the citizenry that we have. Um, we want vo your voices and the voices of, of your pedigree to drive discourse as well and not just uh, WhatsApp discussions. Um, but those, those are the, you know, the, what you, that's the give and take. When, as I'm driving to an end, um, in my work, I'm, I'm working with young people and your book had a, you know, a backward retrospective looking account. You also had a very forward looking um, vision and aspiration articulation on, on where the country is going. And I find it to be philosophical because we talk about the born free generation, uh, you know, a 31 year old Namibian today, um, we, we, we can't talk about leadership in the 21st century without assessing the state of our young people, where they are now and their preparedness to, 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 to lead and to take the baton. But the question is, where are they going to? They're born free from what? We can deduce that they're born free from oppression, from repression, from, you know, from uh, any kind of marginalization, and they are born into a dispensation of identity, of self-actualization. But um, the enemy is a little bit different, and it's much harder for them to define their mission now, because all the enemies we, we're deployed with today are invisible, whether it's COVID, whether it's climate change, whether it's poverty, inequality, gender-based violence, these drivers, we don't see them. Uh, in your era, we could see the oppressor, we could point our guns and we could run. Um, and that makes it a bit of a generational challenge. I wanted to hear your views and reflections on the future of the country, especially for the, for the born freeze defining um, what the next looks like. 
that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, where really are we going? Um, and how are we going to gird our loins and, and because it's up to the youth, largely speaking, as to where we will be in another 20 years time. Uh, I won't be here to see it, but you know, you're right. There are different eras. The youth of the 70s and the 80s uh, didn't have it good. Uh, they were under the jackboot of apartheid, but somehow there was a tremendous amount of camaraderie, uh, a spirit of taking on the regime. We had a common enemy to fight and we were prepared to take it on. And there was more, less difference than there is now. And I think now the youth are trying to find that their place in, in this. We have several enemies now. We have the enemies and we know the founding father and the president has said it on a number of occasions. The enemies are poverty and crime and things like that. We need to bring those things to an end because that is, after all, the Namibia we fought for was a Namibia where all uh, her people um, could live decent lives uh, with roofs over their heads and so on. And so that is where we want to be and where we want to get. But at the same time, Desri, you will notice also in the book, I'm concerned um, about what I do feel is, is this kind of feelings of entitlement that started after independence where people really did feel, okay, it's our turn now, we want to eat the fruits is a very common expression. So across the board, whether it's in the, in the corridors of power, uh, down to the poorest communities, this is kind of the aspiration. If that could be positively channeled um, into, into empowerment uh, of themselves, I know the economic circumstances right now are distressing. Um, really for the majority of our youth and frightening statistics of unemployment, which I feel is the absolute priority right now to tackle because um, that's what the youth need to feel that they are doing something, being something. But that having been said, there will always be those, some of the biggest success stories in the world have always come from situations exactly like that. Um, people who have been totally disempowered, who find their own power and, and, and go forward after their dreams. And so really that would be, you know, if I think back as a youth being brought up in a middle-class white background to do what I did, I probably wouldn't have thought that would be doable. So we all find ourselves in situations where we can make a difference and make a positive difference. And oh gosh, we so desperately need more role models in this country to show the way to the youth that, that there is more than simply materialism uh, to go forward. And I would like to emphasize those qualities of Namibia, which I loved and which made me be part of what I am in this Namibia of ours were of kindness and humility and compassion. Um, and, and yes, all, all those things that seem to be lacking today, we need to find that within ourselves again um, and, and, and do away with the cruelty that is happening in our society to a large degree. If we look at the high levels of gender-based violence, it is, and I don't have any answers for you, but I do look at the then and the now. And although we lived under a much worse regime back then, we certainly had it uh, really badly. Uh, somehow Namibians were a better quality of people than they are right now we've lost sight of some of those values that, that brought us to independence and freedom. So again, I would say it's up to the youth to dig deep, even in the bowels of poverty, uh, to find hope. And again, for those in positions of privilege and power to step down from their ivory towers and remember what it was like, because many of them came from exactly that place and to share with others. I, I think, you know, we need to, we need to bring back our humanity as Namibians. I really think it's time. Gwen, it was Andimba Toivo Toivo who said that um, it would be easier to obtain political freedom because that requires a united front in terms of numbers. But prosperity is personal and individual, and that fragments the collective power of, of the group. And I think that is the challenge that we have, is that we are less united because of the individualistic nature. 
of prosperity and development. There was a question, but I think you touched on it, um, that was kind of talking on the type of ethical, moral leadership compass that we need. And I think you've satisfied that. Deolipula, I'll yield back to you. And this will be my final comment, Gwen. And I just want to say, I appreciate the book and I appreciate you engaging us today. And from now I yield to the moderator. Thank you very much, Desiree. Uh, Desiree, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to read a comment uh, quickly on the chat before. Uh, uh, it's from Ipumbu Sakaria. Appreciation to Ms. Gwen for her memoir provided lots of information, further respect to her work in journalism. I find it an excellent read. And that was also shared by, by Harold uh, on the plot, Harold Schutz. Uh, and uh, and having said that, Gwen, if you allow me to to just ask you just some few fun questions for us, and and please just answer with one word. Let me shoot this round fire. I think it's about five or six questions. You've described a day in your office as crazy. What keeps you up at night, Gwen? The world is too much with us. Somebody said once, and uh, oh, you wanted one word, right? <laughs> yes. The world. The world. What, uh, what gets you up early in the morning? Not much. What is your superpower? Oh, Daisy, um, let's say commitment. Well done. What value do you live by? Honesty. One most pressing issue in Namibia today. Oh gosh, I'm trying to put it in one word, sorry. Um, you can do one sentence. Okay, I want to say, let's be kinder to one another. One low-hanging opportunity for Namibia today. Uh, to make a bigger impact in the international world without and, democracy. And your final piece of advice to a young Namibian listening to you today. Again, I'll, I'll cannibalize what I said to you earlier, and that is let us be kinder to one another. Let us be more tolerant of one another. I'm reminding of pieces in the book where a former combatant, Chris Kantewa, which I recount when he got back from exile in 1989, and he had to share a bed with his cousin who was a member of Kufut. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about how uncomfortable the two of them were in that, um, place that night and I thought you know that's what we need to come back to we talk about reconciliation as a policy mm -hmm. and we apply it rather selectively we need to really put that in our hearts and we need to realize that um, many Namibians were on the wrong side of history many black Namibians were on the wrong side of history um, back in the 70s and 80s and they stood with apartheid for whatever reasons and they stood with the South African regime. And we just need to be kinder and realize that people do things through various influences in their life. Some people aren't as strong as others and um, are easily captured by fear. And so let us be kinder to all our people and know that really we all come from the same place. Uh, we want to go in the same direction, which is to a more prosperous and successful and happier Namibia and we're only going to do that if we are more kind to one another. Gwen, thank you very much for releasing your book. It is really a book of the 21st century. It's a book that reflects on our history and the future ahead. I personally had a great opportunity to dive into your book and to read through it. But thank you for making time to share your experience, your views on the world. And we can only co continue to wish you to make opinion for Africa, as you put it in your book. Please continue to make the opinion of Africa. And, uh, and, and Desiree, thank you very much once again for diving into uh, a very, very difficult, interesting, challenging, 
yet very robust book that was ever written over the past few years that I've read. Thank you very much, my sister, for such a great job. And let me also thank the participants for making time on this beautiful Saturday. And uh, please join us next month again as we read our next book. We will communicate the, the, the author and the title in the next few days. Please join us because this month we are going to celebrate uh, our Heroes Day. And therefore the next book that we are going to bring in is really capturing what the best of uh, our history is about to give. And having said that, I just want to leave you again uh, please go and buy Gwen's book, Comrade Editor. You can find it at, the, at, at Book Den, very affordable. And I'm sure it will change your life the way it has changed me and Desri's life. Once again, thank you and goodbye. Asante sana.